cardiology grand rounds from uh, Debeki cardiovascular studio today and my name is Khuram Nasser I'm the chief of cardiovascular prevention and wellness uh, as a cardiovascular uh, preventive cardiology we have seen exponential uh, uh, changes in in the field and you know I have tremendous honor to have someone who has been in the thick and the center of this not only that but propelling a lot of those transformative changes mm -hmm. and in doing so has also uh, mentored and trained almost two generations of preventive mm -hmm. cardiology. Now I can I spend almost an Sorry. hour uh, trying to highlight some of the accomplishments and uh, contributions of uh, Dr. Phil Greenland today, but I, I can just be brief. He is uh, uh, Harry Dingman, uh, Professor of Cardiology at Northwestern. Uh, he joined as the Director of uh, Preventive Medicine in 1991. Uh, uh, replacing uh, the legendary journalist Steimler there and um, as having a conversation starting with just seven faculty and now having almost 75 faculty uh, he has published more than 550 high impact papers and has been consistently funded by NIH and other funding agency um, he has been uh, al almost counted as the two most percent cited uh, scientist in the world and was recently awarded the Arthur Eggerston Award for Cardiovascular Prevention reserved for people who have made significant contribution in cutting back uh, on the heart disease, the burden of the heart disease. Um, so, uh, you know, as someone who has not only been through and propelled where the cardiovascular prevention has been, but also having the pulse uh, where the puck is going to be, uh, I cannot think of m anyone else uh, than Dr. Phil Greenland to give us where the, net, the future of cardiovascular prevention should be with his top 10 predictions. So Phil, thank you so much for joining us live today here from the studio. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasir. Uh, really uh, great pleasure to be here in person in Houston today. Um, and uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity to uh, speak to you about my top 10 predictions for the future of cardiovascular disease uh, prevention. Um, this is my disclosures. And I have one other disclosure uh, related to the talk today, which is um, I'm going to try to cover 10, maybe 11 topics very briefly. Um, I apologize that uh, since it's my top 10 predictions, I, I have to be brief on each one of them. Um, but I hope that I'll give enough uh, detail so that you can consider uh, whether you think these are the correct uh, predictions or not. Um, this is a slide that is attributed to uh, Niels Bohr. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So um, obviously, uh, you know, there's uh, some debate uh, possible about uh, what I'm going to say today. Um, and I think there's a certain humility uh, when thinking about uh, predictions. Uh, here's an editorial from Science in 1996 by the Nobel Prize winners, Michael Brown and, and Joseph Goldstein, uh, where they predicted that heart attacks would disappear by the year 2000. Um, and uh, obviously that has not happened, but I think if you go back and look at this editorial, um, uh, despite the fact that heart attacks didn't go away, it, uh, it contains some really uh, uh, thoughtful ideas about why they might predict that that would happen. So let me just launch into it. And my first prediction here, um, I decided that I would uh, uh, give some tribute to uh, my predecessor at Northwestern, Jeremiah Stamler, that uh, Dr. Nasser mentioned uh, in the introduction. Uh, Dr. Stamler uh, was a um, pioneer in the area of preventive cardiology, um, and he passed away one week ago today at the age of 102. Um, the reason that I'm mentioning Dr. Stamler is not just to give tribute to him, but because of the uh, groundbreaking work that he did. Um, uh, in the upper left part of this is uh, the period of his life when he was doing um, basic science research. 
um, feeding chickens a uh, high fat diet to try to induce atherosclerosis. Um, and as it says on the slide here, um, Dr. Stamler uh, was a legend um, uh, and still working at the age of uh, actually 101, uh, 102. Um, as many of you know, the American Heart Association um, uh, established a new paradigm for um, cardiovascular health promotion and disease reduction in this special report that was published in circulation in 2010. Um, what some of you may not know is that uh, the basis of that recommendation and the uh, establishment of the idea of ide ideal cardiovascular health is really based on some work that uh, Stamler and uh, I and others um, uh, worked on in the uh, 90s and 80s. And that report cited 11 of Stamler's uh, papers uh, as the basis for ideal cardiovascular health. So my prediction is that we'll all be continuing to work with that paradigm. Um, I think we'll extend the paradigm and recognize the importance of uh, uh, promoting ideal cardiovascular health in the future. Uh, my second prediction is that I believe that we will be treating unfavorable cholesterol levels earlier in life. So uh, this slide shows the paradigm for um, uh, lipid uh, intervention and uh, risk reduction um, from the HAACC for primary prevention. Um, and as indicated here, for people under the age of 20, unless there's uh, evidence of familial hypercholesterolemia, the recommendation is lifestyle uh, intervention and, um, and no further uh, assessment of uh, lipids. For people uh, between 20 and 39, um, again, the recommendation is largely based on uh, lifestyle intervention and uh, not aggressive uh, lipid management. So the question is, is that appropriate? Should we be considering um, in that age group uh, more early uh, intervention for uh, cholesterol that's uh, in the unfavorable range? So what's the evidence? Well, the evidence is that uh, the cumulative exposure to LDL over the lifespan is associated with uh, accelerating risk of atherosclerosis and heart attacks. And this is a paper that was published uh, in JAMA Cardiology uh, last year. It's based on pooled data from four prospective cohort studies listed here, um, major cohort studies that uh, examined people relatively early in life and followed them uh, over the uh, lifespan. Uh, and what it shows is that the higher the uh, cumulative LDL exposure over the lifespan, the higher the risk of uh, atherosclerotic events. And there was an editorial in that uh, issue of JAMA Cardiology, and uh, the authors of the editorial suggested that this study um, indicates or suggests that the current guideline endorsed paradigm of deferring treatment of mild and moderate elevations of LDL cholesterol in young adults not only misses a critical opportunity for prevention, but also may unnecessarily allow lipid-related risk to accumulate over the decades. And uh, literally two days ago, as I was putting my last slides together for this talk, uh, I picked up the uh, European Heart Journal uh, and saw this editorial by Eugene Brownwald where he literally says exactly the same thing. How to live to 100 before developing clinical coronary artery disease. Um, and he shows on this uh, graphic that there may be a threshold for uh, cumulative LDL burden and if one's LDL is very high early in life, one reaches that LDL burden earlier. That's the red line. 
um, if the LDL burden is uh, you know, delayed somewhat, um, the burden is reached uh, at a later age. But if one could slow down the cumulative uh, effect of LDL over the lifespan, potentially uh, people could reach the age of 100 free of atherosclerotic clinical disease, uh, which is what Dr. Stamler did during his lifetime. Um, as I was thinking about that particular topic, I was reminded of this important paper from the New England Journal in 1991. This is a very interesting study that's very f infrequently cited, um, but what it's based on is measurement of cholesterol of medical students at Johns Hopkins um, in the 1960s who were then followed for the next 30 years. And based on cholesterol level alone, you can see that uh, people with lower cholesterol had a much lower cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease over the next 40 years. Um, and people with higher cholesterol had much higher cumulative uh, cardiovascular disease over the uh, follow-up period. So we've really known this for a very long time, that early life exposure to high cholesterol is uh, deleterious. Um, and I do believe that based on both lifestyle approach and drugs, which I'll talk about a little bit later, it's possible that we will be uh, intervening much more aggressively much earlier in life. My third prediction has to do with polygenic risk scores. And for some of you who may have followed things that I've written in the past, this may not be much of a surprise. Um, but I think that polygenic risk scores, although there's a lot written about it today, I don't really think it's going to help us very much in battling CHD. And I'll show you a few examples of why I think that's true. So this is a graph from a paper published in JAMA in 2010. And what's depicted here is the uh, distribution of uh, cardiovascular disease risk uh, based on the 100 known uh, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms for uh, coronary disease that were known as of 2010. Uh, and the distribution of those risk scores in people with cardiovascular disease and without cardiovascular disease um, is totally overlapping here. You can see from the distributions that you can't distinguish the scores in people with and without cardiovascular disease. So I read this in 2010 and I thought, all right, uh, where's this gonna go? And are we gonna be able to show eventually that polygenic risk scores will uh, make an impact. So coming up in 2018, uh, several papers were published. Um, and this is a quote from Robert Roberts based on one of those papers from 2018, suggesting that, as written here, the final confirmation that genetic risk score can be used at any time, at any age, to predict the risk of CAD and MI. So let me just delve into that, uh, uh, the results from that paper a little bit. This is a paper that was published in Jack um, in 2018 that Dr. Roberts referred to. It's based on uh, genetic risk prediction in uh, close to 500,000 people from the UK Biobank. Um, and the, the uh, C statistics, which is the uh, measure of discrimination, the ability to uh, identify based on a score the likelihood that somebody uh, will be in the uh, risk group or not in the risk group. Um, and what you can see here is that, see if I can make the, uh, the pointer work. I'm not sure I know how to do it, but the, maybe it's, hmm. All right, I'm going to pass on the, on the um, pointer for a moment, but just to indicate that the C statistics are laid out here, and you can see um, 
uh, about the fourth one from the uh, right hand side of the, uh, ah, there we go, the top. Ah, good, okay, thank you so much. So um, the C statistic here for the uh, polygenic risk score is here. The C statistic for the uh, traditional risk factors is higher. And there's a small increment when the traditional risk factors and the polygenic risk score are uh, added together. But the highest C statistic alone is for traditional risk factors. Continuing the story, uh, this is a paper that was uh, published uh, in 2020 in uh, JAMA, Predictive Accuracy of a Polygenic Risk Score Compared to a Clinical Risk Score. And the conclusion here is that the polygenic risk score didn't significantly improve discrimination, calibration, or risk reclassification. So looking at the data from that uh, paper, um, the key findings are listed here. Um, looking at a base model and the addition of the polygenic risk score uh, to that base model. And what you can see is that there's really no change in the C statistic when the uh, polygenic risk score is added to the base model. Uh, there are other studies out there that have suggested that the polygenic risk score would be uh, uh, helpful and advantageous. This is one from Nature Genetics in 2018. This has been a very highly cited paper. And one of the things that struck me when I looked at this paper is the risk distribution scores um, of the uh, pe people in the control group compared to the cases. Uh, indicating significant overlap between the risk scores in the two groups. And uh, looking at the odds ratios, um, comparing the top 20% to the remaining 80%, you can see that the odds ratio looks reasonably impressive, 2.5 um, in, in that group. So what does that mean exactly? Um, so what we did to try to understand exactly what that means is that we um, took the data from that paper and plugged it into a model that graphs the detection rate according to a uh, false positive rate um, for a specified odds ratio. And uh, we plugged in uh, the 80% uh, uh, proportion in the low risk group, which I showed on the previous slide. We plugged in 20% in the high risk group and the odds ratio of 2.55. And when you do that and you plot the risk scores in the two groups, you can see that there's quite substantial overlap between those two groups. And uh, it works out to a false positive rate of 29% uh, for a 50% detection rate. And if you take it one step further, and try to get a 90% detection rate, the false positive rate is higher than 75%. So um, I think one could reasonably ask the question of whether a test that uh, performs that way is, is useful uh, for clinical medicine. My fourth prediction is that I think inflammation is going to be a, a treatable aspect of atherosclerosis, um, but I don't think we yet have the drugs that are potent enough uh, to be really helpful. Um, and I do think that there's evidence out there that much more potent, much more targeted drugs may come down the line. Uh, this is probably my most uh, um, far out there prediction um, for the morning. Um, as you all know, uh, several years ago, um, Dr. Ridker and others published this uh, important paper on the use of canakinumab in um, uh, high-risk patients uh, with uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and the patients treated with canakinumab 
uh, had a lower risk of development of atherosclerotic events compared to the placebo group. Um, this slide just shows the baseline data of the people in that study, and one of the things that struck me was that these are very high-risk people um, who weren't particularly well controlled on their uh, other risk factors. So one of the things that could reasonably ask about that study is what would it have looked like if uh, the patients had been aggressively treated for all of their risk factors. But I, think, I still think the main point is that that study indicates that there may be an important inflammatory component that could be treated if we had the right drugs available. And this paper was published just uh, a few months ago in PNAS. Uh, and it's an experimental study in uh, an animal model showing that a uh, targeted polyelectrolyte complex treats the vascular complications of atherosclerosis in vivo. Um, my sense about this paper was that it was an amazing scientific accomplishment, something that uh, potentially uh, could really make a difference. And this is a drug that directly targets the uh, atherosclerotic uh, plaques themselves um, uh, and doesn't really have a uh, significant um, uh, uh, general effect beyond uh, the atherosclerotic plaque itself. So my hope and my prediction is that this uh, may be a modality that we're eventually using um, in clinical practice. My fifth prediction has to do with coronary artery calcium. Um, and this is a modality, as many of you know, that's been out there for um, easily uh, 30 years. Uh, we've learned a tremendous amount about the predictive value of uh, coronary calcium, both high levels and low levels. Um, and my sense about it is that we still have uh, much to learn, as we've continued to show uh, in papers that are being published uh, literally uh, every week. Um, this is a paper from uh, last October that got a great deal of attention uh, in the media, Association of Age with Diagnostic Value of Coronary Artery Calcium. Um, and uh, one of the things that was striking uh, to the media about this paper was that um, in patients with uh, coronary artery calcium of zero, uh, there was a measurable number of those patients that had obstructive uh, coronary atherosclerosis. Um, that number turned out to be actually pretty small. This is shown on the uh, graphic here. Um, these are people who uh, didn't have obstructive disease and in the gray are people with obstructive disease by age. And you can see that there's a, a, a relatively small but measurable uh, proportion of people with uh, low zero coronary calcium who uh, in fact had measurable atherosclerosis. And the conclusion of the paper was overall among symptomatic patients with coronary calcium of zero, about 6% had obstructive coronary artery disease. And this got, again, a lot of attention based on the concern that we have typically said that people who have uh, CAC of zero um, are I incredibly low risk. Well, it turns out that um, we've known this um, for quite a while. And uh, my colleague and I, Bob Bono, um, published this editorial in circulation about 10 years ago. How low risk is a coronary score of zero? Um, and the point is that it really depends on the patient population that you're looking at. And in the table here, um, which is perhaps a little bit complicated, but the paper we were commenting on is this paper right here. And again, it was symptomatic patients uh, referred for uh, coronary calcium measurement. And the uh, event rate in those people was uh, about 3% per year. But in asymptomatic patients, um, such as what we've seen in uh, population studies like uh, this one that uh, I published um, in the late 90s, 
and other population studies like from the MESA study, um, the event rates are incredibly low in asymptomatic healthy people. So obviously we've known for a while that a uh, calcium score of zero is very meaningful, but it needs to be uh, understood what the patient population is that we're talking about. Um, just just uh, one month ago in January, uh, another paper came out on this same topic, uh, uh, looking at the risk factors that are associated with um, uh, the presence of coronary calcium uh, in uh, people who have, uh, sorry, in risk factors that are associated with events in people uh, with coronary calcium of zero. And the findings of that study were that people who had key risk factors for atherosclerosis had a much higher risk of developing uh, atherosclerotic events. And this study from uh, the MESA uh, published in the European Heart Journal several years ago indicated exactly the same thing, uh, plotting the uh, risk factors on the x-axis um, against coronary calcium score on the uh, y-axis here. People with cal calcium score of zero and no risk factors had the lowest risk of atherosclerotic events. People with uh, three risk factors and calcium score of zero or two risk factors had a higher risk. So we've known this for a while and I think we're going to continue to learn more and more as we look uh, more deeply at the available data. Uh, prediction six is um, an unfortunate one, um, but I think a true one. Obesity is going to continue to cause major problems due to cardiometabolic disease. Um, so this is a headline from uh, 2018 uh, from the uh, New York Times. Um, and it just so happens that when I took this out of the New York Times, um, the advertisement on it uh, was featuring uh, 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 the, the uh, restaurant scene in Houston, um, which is kind of uh, interesting considering uh, the, the location of this talk today. But as we know, um, and we know it unfortunately very well, um, as we've plotted the prevalence of overweight and obesity over the years, um, the curves are going in an unfavorable direction, and this is associated with um, uh, worsening uh, degrees of hypertension, worsening degrees of, of uh, diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases, including uh, high triglycerides and so forth. And I think we're, we're unfortunately on a uh, trajectory here that's uh, really unfavorable. Hopefully we can figure out ways to uh, uh, reverse this and turn it around. Um, and one possibility uh, that we need to consider is the kinds of things that uh, other countries are doing, uh, trying to uh, go back to spending more time on physical activity uh, in the schools and encouraging um, much more uh, uh, active lifestyles rather than uh, you know, spending all day long on screens as uh, many of our uh, young people are doing today. My seventh prediction is, um, again, I think one that we're seeing already playing out um, in everyday preventive cardiology, which is uh, that I think that it's clear that the uh, diabetes drugs are emerging as standard treatments in cardiovascular disease prevention today. Um, as I was preparing this talk, um, the 2021 ESC guidelines on cardiovascular disease prevention came out. Um, and uh, as I was reading it, I was noticing the word diabetes again and again. Um, the word count f for the word diabetes in that practice guideline um, 209 times the word diabetes is mentioned um, uh, compared to the word lipid, uh, which was uh, present only 90 times. 
um, in the paper, or cholesterol, 113 times. So this is obviously recognized as a growing problem uh, within cardiovascular disease prevention. And the good news is that we now have uh, some really important drugs that um, have been shown to be effective in clinical trials. And as the ESC indicated, some of these drugs have uh, risen to the level of class 1A recommendations. For example, the first recommendation in persons with type 2 diabetes and ASCVD using a GLP-1 or a SGLT2 inhibitor has proven outcome benefits and is recommended to reduce cardiovascular and cardiorenal outcomes. So I think this is an area that almost doesn't need prediction. It's something that's already happening, uh, but I suspect that over time what we're gonna find is that um, more and more of our patients are gonna be on these drugs, more and more uh, general internists are gonna be joining the cardiologists and the diabetologists in the use of these drugs. Um, and I assume that most of you listening today are familiar with these trials, uh, Empareg, um, Canvas, et cetera, that have demonstrated reduction in cardiovascular disease events um, in various uh, clinical settings. Um, these drugs seem to have protein effects um, on a variety of different aspects of uh, cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease um, depicted on this slide. Um, and uh, as many of us know, th these were unexpected or relatively unexpected uh, beneficial effects of, uh, lipid lo of uh, glucose lowering drugs. Um, and we now have um, an AHA statement that just came out uh, in the last month, recommending comprehensive management of cardiovascular risk factors uh, for adults with type 2 diabetes. My eighth prediction has to do with uh, sensors and the use of sensors um, in early disease detection, particularly for things like atrial fibrillation. And where I think this field is right now is not quite there. Uh, but my prediction is that it will get there. So um, we've all been reading about this. This is an example from the Wall Street Journal several years, years ago, um, uh, suggesting that we were on the threshold of a new uh, era of early detection of um, various different kinds of disease states such as atrial fibrillation. And we all know that there is the opportunity to um, identify abnormal heart rhythms with things like smartwatches. Um, what we have so far is two studies, and there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm really not gonna attempt to go through it. I merely wanna point out that there's two clinical trials that have been published now um, in the last year in Lancet. One is uh, stroke stop. Um, which indicated a uh, rather um, small but statistically significant difference in uh, outcomes in people who um, participated in having um, early detection of atrial fibrillation. Um, but a second study called the LOOP study, uh, which was done in people with an implantable uh, LOOP recorder for detection of atrial fibrillation in high-risk people, did not show um, uh, a benefit. So we're left at the current time with uh, sort of an unclear uh, outcome about uh, where it stands for early detection of atrial fibrillation using uh, devices. Um, and as many of you know, just again, a few weeks ago, the US Preventive Services Task Force um, released their final statement on screening for atrial fibrillation. And they suggested that based on current evidence, um, the, the recommendation to uh, attempt to screen for atrial fibrillation um, using devices as opposed to the clinical setting um, still needed more evidence. Um, and I was asked to write the editorial on that. 
And although I indicated in the editorial that I and many others have great enthusiasm for the opportunity, um, it looks like we still need more data. And the things that I think are necessary here for this to really move forward is, we, for example, we need more information about how long an episode of atrial fibrillation is important. Does it matter if we, if we detect a 30 second episode? Does it matter if we detect a six minute episode? Does it need to be a 24 hour episode? So these are questions that actually go beyond the mechanism of screening itself. They're really more clinical questions and I think between the technology and answering the clinical questions, we'll eventually get to the point where this is going to be a meaningful approach to early detection of important diseases and give us an opportunity to prevent stroke in people who are having silent uh, atrial arrhythmias. Uh, my ninth prediction, again, uh, depends on uh, uh, where you stand on this topic. Uh, for some people, this is an issue that's already live and already happening. But I think for a lot of people, this is a topic that's still largely unknown. Um, I think the long-term consequences of uh, adverse pregnancy experiences, uh, such as preeclampsia, uh, small for gestational age uh, birth, et cetera, um, uh, have already been recognized as uh, related to long-term risk of cardiovascular disease. But for a variety of reasons, this is still largely unrecognized, uh, undiscussed uh, in the clinical setting, and largely uh, not treated. And this is a great missed opportunity, which I predict in the future uh, we will be able to turn around. So um, just to do a little bit of history here, um, uh, when uh, Dr. Bernadine Healy was the director of the National Institutes of Health, she published this editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine um, talking about the Yentl syndrome. And Yentl was a, um, uh, a tale of a young girl who wanted to study in uh, the, um, the yeshivas of Europe, uh, the, the, the study halls where people learn uh, the, the laws of, of Judaism. Uh, but at the time, girls were not allowed to learn uh, that material. Uh, not true today, but it was true earlier. And uh, in order for Yentl, her name, to be able to learn with the boys, uh, she dressed up as a boy. And what Dr. Healy was pointing out here is that, um, that we needed to wake up, that women were at risk for a variety of diseases, particularly cardiovascular diseases. Um, and she stated, it's time for a general awakening. Women have unique medical problems. Um, and she initiated um, what we all know now as the Women's Health Initiative. Um, and despite the fact that uh, she initiated that, what's 30 years ago, um, it's taken many, many years uh, for the, the knowledge of uh, women's unique cardiovascular risk to penetrate. Um, and this is just a few examples. This is from one of the um, American Heart Association uh, guidelines for cardiovascular disease prevention in women from 2007. And in 2007, uh, the risks associated with pregnancy were mentioned in the document, but not mentioned in the list of uh, topics to screen for in the clinical setting. Uh, coming up to 2018, uh, things had already begun to change. Um, and the American Heart Association and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, put their hands together, um, wrote this uh, important paper on promoting risk identification and risk reduction um, in women and highlighted in the, the, the recommendations the importance of uh, pregnancy um, uh, and adverse pregnancy experiences in increasing women's risk uh, over the lifespan. 
And just last year, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes um, finally made it into the headline uh, of uh, a recommendation from the American Heart Association. So what's the risk exactly? The risk of these uh, different um, uh, uh, adverse pregnancy experiences um, uh, has been highlighted in uh, a variety of different uh, meta-analyses. This is just one. Um, but uh, we know f now from a variety of long-term studies that there is a risk. And what's missing is what we talked about um, in this viewpoint uh, just published a few weeks ago in uh, JAMA, uh, indicating not only that there are these long-term risks, but it's necessary for us to uh, become much more aggressive about identifying them and treating them over the long term. And coming up now to my 10th prediction, um, I think that where we uh, are beginning to see a new revolution in, in cholesterol-lowering drugs, and I think we're going to see something uh, as uh, important as what we saw with the statins 30 years ago. And obviously what I'm talking about here is new drugs like um, inclycerin, um, which the FDA approved just recently. Um, Inclycerin, as um, many of you undoubtedly already know, is uh, a drug that's given um, or potentially given only once a year. Um, the LDL lowering effects are long lasting. Um, and by the time they start to wane, um, after about a year, um, one could potentially have another injection. And as many people have talked about, this could represent the equivalent of a vaccination against atherosclerosis, something that might be given uh, once a year. And as we uh, think about what we've been going through the last couple of years, uh, maybe there's going to be a whole new panel of vaccinations, not only for infectious diseases, but for uh, atherosclerosis. And um, I don't think one can conclude a talk in 2022 without uh, saying something about COVID. Um, so I'm gonna, turns out I do have time for an 11th prediction. Um, and my 11th prediction um, is that I'm afraid to say that COVID-19 will be with us a lot longer. So what's my evidence for that? So um, I wanna cite uh, an interview that uh, I read um, from Dr. Jeremy Brown, who's probably a name that's not known to very many of you in cardiology. Dr. Brown is the Director of Emergency Medicine Research at the NIH. Um, and he's had a long-standing interest in influenza. And in 2018, Dr. Brown published a book on the influenza pandemic of 1918. So, um, two years before uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and um, I would recommend this book. Uh, I have no connection to the book and I don't get any royalties from the book. Um, but I found it absolutely amazing to read this book on influenza uh, from 1918. And many of the things that we experienced in the last two years, the denial for example, about the infectiousness of the virus, the um, desire to um, uh, go about one's life and act as if there was nothing happening, even though millions and millions of people were getting sick, um, the disagreements between uh, different politicians um, and scientists about how to treat um, the influenza pandemic of 100 years ago, and um, what Dr. Brown said in this book, published in 2018, he said, I don't think we're ready for the next pandemic. We haven't figured these things out yet. Um, and he pointed out in the book, as we all know, that um, the pandemic eventually went away, but the disease did not. And we're still dealing with influenza 
a uh, hundred years later. So that's prediction 11, but prediction 11A is maybe COVID-19 won't be with us a lot longer. Um, and my support for this is not a, a scientist, but it's uh, Bill Gates. Um, and again, as I was preparing for this talk, I came across this prediction from Bill Gates um, suggesting that the pandemic will finally end in 2022. Um, and in his yearly report to his uh, foundation, uh, he listed his reasons for optimism after a difficult year. And he said here, your individual risk level will be eventually low enough that you won't need to factor into your decision making that risk. It won't be primary when deciding whether to work from the office or let your kids go to their soccer game or watch a movie in a theater. And I think as what we're seeing now, um, a lot of people are suggesting that this is exactly the direction that the pandemic is going. Um, I'm pleased that I was the first um, in-person speaker here at uh, Houston Methodist uh, in two years. Um, I finally got to the point where I was optimistic enough to think that I could travel here. Um, and uh, um, I, I really hope that my 11A prediction is correct and not my 11 prediction. Um, so to conclude, um, the last thing that I want to say is something also that uh, Bill Gates uh, talked about in his uh, report to his foundation. Um, he, he talked a lot in here about combating disinformation, and I think this is an area that maybe we all need to think about um, a little bit more. Our opportunity as healthcare professionals to um, lead the way and help all of us understand not only our cardiovascular risks, but uh, all of our risks um, uh, related to uh, disease and prevention. Um, and finally, I'll close with this cartoon. Are you coming to bed? I can't, this is important. What? Someone's wrong on the internet. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, wow, Phil, thank you so much. This is fantastic. Now, thankfully, we have enough time so for discussion. And, you know, I just got a comment, and uh, this was exactly echoes my sentiment. Thank you, Phil, for this clear, provocative presentation. No one teaches and presents epidemiology better than you. I'm sure that Dr. Stamler was listening and smiling down on his successor. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, it, it's a whirlwind and you've, you've really taken us over the last 30 plus years and showing us the peak into the future. A few questions that have come our way. One is in the teens and the 20s, of course, now you have suggested and I couldn't agree more the direction about treating early for cholesterol. What would be considered a high cholesterol at that stage? So, as you know, one of the uh, topics that the Heart Association is talking about now um, with ideal cardiovascular health is <clears throat> ideal levels of lipids and blood pressure and so forth. I think one of the problems that we have in, in medicine is distinguishing ideal from what you might call normal. And when, when elevated levels are um, essentially the, the you know, prevalent within the population, those begin to appear to be normal. But they're not normal no. because they're not, a, they're not at the ideal level. So I think in, in you know, teens and early 20s, um, the ideal level would be you know, LDL 60, 70, something in that range. Um, you know, the slide that I showed from the Johns Hopkins medical students, um, you know, from 40 years ago, um, the lowest risk group was having total cholesterols, you know, below 200. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that's what we would expect to be um, 
the ideal. Perfect. Uh, one of the common things is this pill disutility, trying to convince folks to take pills for something that would prevent an event in the next 5, 10, and now if we move the needle to in their 20s and 30s, asking them to be on a medication, a pill a day maybe to reduce the risk, that may be 20, 30 years down the line. Now you showed your prediction that we may see a shift in how we treat cholesterol. Do you think that Inclerasin or similar agents may take lead in those efforts where you may get a shot or two shots a year and you're done with, with you don't have to take a pill a day? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I join a number of other people in thinking that might happen. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, there would be opposition to that for a lot of reasons, you know, taking a medication, um, until we have some proof that it's really, um, you know, preventing at least the development of atherosclerosis to give us some sense that this is really, um, you know, heading in the direction of um, extending the healthy life. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I joined Dr. Brownwald <laughs> in, in uh, you know, sharing that prediction. I suspect that, you know, you might share that uh, prediction as well. Um, I mean, it would be, it would be great if the, if the real answer to that was, you know, a greater prevalence of ideal cardiovascular health and more people with, you know, ideal body weight and regular exercise and favorable diet um, <clears throat> and I think all of us would, uh, would understand from a prevention point of view, that's the ideal. That's what we would really like to promote. Um, and if we could make that happen, then I don't think we'd have to be using drugs. The flip side is if we can't make that happen, are we willing to accept drugs as the approach? And I think that's what we probably, uh, at least for some segments of the population, that's what we may need to accept. Perfect. Uh, great segue to the third question that came my way is, uh, you know, you rightly mentioned obesity going to be one of our biggest challenges and not only for cardi cardiovascular, hypertension, many other organs, but also diabetes. Um, the tide is rising, especially in the young adults, which is very challenging and we have I think so far miserably failed out there in trying to control it. Now, of course, we continue to and we should focus and emphasize lifestyle intervention, policy changes, controlling food substances that may promote obesogenicity. But do you think we may eventually be in the same direction of maybe treating or l obesity or uh, something like we are treating cholesterol with medications? Medication. <coughs> Well, it, it's hard not to see it going that direction, um, but um, I'm hesitating because it's such an unfortunate uh, way of treating what is largely, I think, uh, we could say related to, you know, our life habits. Um, you know, we, we know that uh, there is a genetic component to obesity, there's no doubt about it. But the rising prevalence can't be attributed to uh, changes in our genetic makeup. This is clearly a lifestyle issue. Um, I think it's uh, unfortunate where we are with uh, um, uh, you know people getting their entertainment from screens instead of uh, you know getting out and uh, playing sports and running and you know. Uh, having an active, healthy lifestyle. Um, so I think it would be unfortunate, but um, uh, until we come up with a, a, you know, a more effective strategy, like you said, you know, policy, um, you know, physical activity in the schools again, um, and so forth, I think we're, we're uh, running up against the possibility of um, uh, more use of drugs, even for obesity. On the same line, you know, in Phil, in recent years, especially with the COVID-19, it has shed lights on, you know, the challenges that many vulnerable communities face. And um, 
we have known in cardiology well even before the crisis that the gains that we have had in reduction in the cardiovascular mortality or the risk factor controls unfortunately has not been shared equitably across the vulnerable populations yeah. how do we deal with that issues what what's the role of a health system and us as, as a society in trying to of course we have focused a lot on the genetics and the biology and but what about the social determinants a how do we incorporate into our clinical practice and how do we address that what's the role of a health system in that space <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> it's a tough one, it's but a, again, it's, it's an answer I don't have, but we see those challenges day in, day out, and uh, we, we just feel that, you know, just pointing on the treatments and interventions, but the implementation piece that you have been advocating for a long period has not gained traction so far. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you're raising just an incredibly important point, which is, um, you know, the addressing the population-wide problem that we have, which, uh, you know, reminds me very much of Dr. Stamler and the things that he used to talk about. Um, you know, population-wide problems should be addressed at the population-wide level. Um, it becomes very difficult to try to tackle those problems, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. So. You know, we all recognize that we we're, we're, we have these um, very difficult, you know, social circumstances, um, lack of good um, uh, health insurance, unequal distribution of uh, you know health services. So I do uh, agree with you that you know health systems need to play a role. I don't know what that looks like exactly, but you know, government needs to play a role. Communities themselves undoubtedly need to play a role. Healthcare providers, health systems. Um, but I don't, I mean, that's a complicated one that I don't have even a prediction about, mm -hmm. let alone a solution for. Right. No, I, you know, a couple of things that also come in mind with these new newer therapies coming onto the play, uh, definitely the cost is going to be a big issue. Uh, my, my sense is that unfortunately, for example, with obesity medications or these high-end cholesterol medications where we see a lot of our vulnerable populations where the burden is much higher, who may need it much more, unfortunately may not be able to afford and yes. it may become an issue who, not who needs it, but who affords it. And uh, that just widens the gap of the disparities that exist. So as we celebrate i would say the innovations i'm just trying hard and say how can we ensure that we are not leaving behind <coughs> the folks who need it the most yeah no i think your point is well taken and you know the answer has got to be at the societal level right society needs to take responsibility and understand that um you know it's not just what i can afford it's what you know we can all provide for each other and you know this has not been how we manage health care in america but you know what you're raising is something that um you know needs to be discussed at that kind of a level maybe you'll solve that problem well we're all trying hard so phil final question i think so we have one one minute you know from physicians who see patients in front of them and of course I remember your prediction once that uh, people will be looking for biomarkers polygenic as as a one but calcium testing would really try in for two things one is helping people understand de-risking and the second thing is uh, helping them to take the medication the question is where do you see the future of the calcium testing implementation right now we have enough evidence do you think it would be we think it's ready for prime time but do you think system-wide, insurance-wide, CMS-wise, we'll have some few answers coming out shortly so that it can be widely adoptable of all the work that you and many others have done over the last 20, 30 years. So I'll try to be quick on this. I, I think that where this is going is exactly where the guidelines are right now. <clears throat> what the guidelines are saying is this is not about screening. It's about using 
you know, judiciously, you know, selectively, the use of coronary calcium testing for um, clinical decision making. And this is how we do everything properly in clinical medicine is, you know, based on our hypothesis about what's going on with the patient, that's how we decide what the next test is. That's what we decide is the next procedure. So I think exactly the same thing with coronary calcium. I hope that the insurance companies eventually get to the point where they understand that coronary calcium is just another test like any other test that's used by clinicians when it's needed and only appropriately. Um, and that's where I think this is gonna go. And that's exactly where the guidelines are. Well, thank you, Phil, for joining us today. You know, it has been a fantastic discussion. As always, I and I'm sure most of you would have learned a lot. Uh, all I can say, the future for cardiovascular prevention is bright and great to be reminded of the direction that it will be taking from someone like Phil, who has been a champion and has been leading these efforts for the last many decades. So thank you, Phil, again. Thank you for joining us live in the thank studio. You. Thank you. Thank you.